Today we are talking about the brand new, just released Lightroom CC 2.2 update. This is the February 2019 update and there are some pretty sweet new features in here. A couple of the big ones that have been holding a lot of people back from moving to CC from the classic version. The biggest ones we're seeing in here is HDR and panoramic merging. And there's a neat little thing in here where they actually do both at the same time. Let's just take a quick look at what is new. So there's create HDR and panorama, enhanced details, clipping indicators, and target adjustments. The HDR and panoramic things are not in the mobile versions. I would imagine this is a processing power issue as well as the enhancement one that's not in mobile either. So we're starting to see a little bit more of a split, unfortunately, between what we have in mobile and desktop. Uh, hopefully they will be manage to stay essentially feature parity for the duration of their lives. That's what we really want to see. But for now, we are seeing a little bit of differences. I've selected these five images here. I can either go to the photo menu and choose photo merge from here, and you'll see there's HDR merge, panorama, and HDR panorama, which Again, I just, I gotta say, that is so cool. I have done these before where you've had to do them by hand, where you did a panoramic HDR. So you shot your three, five, seven, whatever bracketed shots once and then moved over, did it again, did it again, end up with a huge amount of files. And then you had to go in and build the HDRs for each one of those and then take those HDRs and build the pano. I actually still have that stack in here. I've only ever done it once. It was just kind of a, hmm, I wonder if I could do this. And it worked, but we're gonna do it with 63 pictures, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to this base HDR merge, and this is just five files. This is five raw files, and we'll see what it can do. There's the HDR build out of it. There's not a whole lot of options in here. You'll see up at the top here, we have an auto align option, an auto settings option, and then a de-ghosting slider. So let's, uh, let's actually get rid of the de-ghosting. There's nothing really moving in this scene, so we don't have to worry about that too much. I don't have to worry about auto align either because this was shot on a tripod. Auto align is something that's really handy if you're hand holding your HDR bracket. That will help to realign things. It, uh, I, I haven't looked really close to compare whether there's any disadvantage to having it on here, but if we don't need it, why well, have it on basically? And then auto settings, all this does is actually dial in the settings after the HDR merge is created. So you're going to get a DNG file out of this. It is going to apply exposure, highlight, shadow, et cetera, et cetera, settings in an auto sort of way. If you turn this off right now, as it is here, you'll see what's basically kind of a mid-range image. It's probably essentially the middle image that, uh, of the stack that we built. If we turn this on again, we're going to see some automatic settings applied to it. There's no disadvantage whatsoever to applying the auto settings because you can simply reset the image after it's created if you want to, and you'll go back to the native DNG file without any adjustments made to it. So really there's no disadvantage as far as I can tell to leaving this on. So I'll go ahead and leave that turned on. So let me just click on merge here. I mean, you'll see it puts things into a stack, which is kind of cool. Automatically puts them in a stack. So there's the new one, the HDR and the five originals. We'll go ahead and open this guy up. And before I do anything to it, let me go down to the info panel here and show you how we know that it's the HDR. It still shows that it is a raw file. So we're still gonna see that. But if you look at the file name, it says dash HDR. So that's the HDR that built and dot DNG. So it has created a dot DNG file. So that means that we are still working in raw space. It's just put that into an, a DNG, which is the same thing that Lightroom Classic had done. All right, so with that said, now let's uh, see what we can do. If I go up to the adjustments here, you'll see all these adjustments that have already been made. But of course, at this point, I can do whatever I want to this. So this is kind of neat. Um, if I go to, let me just, kind of use this as a sample. I'll go to a, another photo in here, one of the standard ones. If I go to the exposure slider and I drag this, you'll see that my maximum is plus five to minus five. That's the range that I have in there. However, when I go to the HDR image and I do the same thing, you'll see that I now have an exposure range all the way up to plus 10 and minus 10. So quite a bit bigger range in there. And this is a neat way to kind of just rack through the file and see exactly what detail is in there. And that's something that I actually advise just forget about HDR for a second. When you're looking at a raw file, and if the raw file has got a lot of dynamic range and maybe your highlights are blown or your shadows are lost and you're not really sure if the data is there in the raw file, 
before you spend a bunch of time adjusting highlights and shadows and trying really hard to get things exactly right, just grab that exposure slider and rack it up and down and see if the data is even there. This will tell you that it, whether it's worth trying to recover that data. And in this case, we can see that there's a huge amount of data here. Uh, racking, as we bring the exposure up, we've got all the detail here in the trees. And then as we bring it down, we see we have some nice detail in the clouds and the sky in there. And of course, that's because we've built that little HDR. So let me do one more HDR in here. I'm going to use this sample here. We've got some motion blur of people moving, but as I go through them, you'll see there is definitely people in the scene in here. So that's something that the software is going to have to compensate for. So let's select all of those. I'll right click this time, choose photo merge, HDR merge. So I've got auto align turned off again because this was on a tripod. Auto settings, again, I can turn that on or off and we'll see the image with and without the enhancements. And the deghosting, and this is a, a good one to look at here, a good image for this. If you look down on the bottom here, you'll see, well, it looks like there's no people at all in this scene. There's a little ghosting of some feet over here, but let's go ahead and take the, uh, the ghosting amount up and we'll go to a low setting. And every time you change this, it does have to generate a preview again. Okay, now we're starting to see some people. There's a, there's a person in there, a uh, little bit of a, a footless person, so it's not really a great, great version of it. So let's try bringing the deghost up to another level. There we go, we've got his foot back, still a little bit of ghosting. There's some weird, pixeling happening over here. And if we click on this show deghost overlay, then we're going to actually see where it's pulling data from and where it's actually doing the deghosting work. So how would you solve that? There's a lot of different things you could do. Obviously, you could just go without the deghosting and let there be no people in it if you wanted to have the images of the people in there, but you had a problem like that kind of weirdly pixelated area. Then maybe you're going to have to get into Photoshop and start doing a little compositing. Maybe you build multiple versions of the image, do a little painting between them. At the end of the day, if this is a critical image and that's a problem and you need to have the figures in there, you can solve it. It's going to take a little extra effort. It's not going to be automated, but it certainly is a solvable problem. In this case, you know, you choose whatever is the best of it and, and go for it. And maybe even you can just retouch that out with the healing brush in there. You know, who knows? But you can definitely, definitely solve the issue. Now let's do a pano. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to search for a pano real quick. Um, tip for searching through your photos. Let me go back to the all photos view for a moment here. And if you click on search all photos in here, you have the ability to search by album name. I don't know that many people know that. This search field up here is actually really, really powerful. If you type in things like ISO, it'll give you ISO search results. So where you may not have the extensive menu structure that you have in Lightroom Classic, where you can choose uh, ISO and then you see a list of all the ISOs in there, you can actually just type things in in here and get pretty much the same. I don't think it's quite exactly the same yet, but pretty much the same options, which is kind of neat. So I'm going to type in album and colon, and then I'm going to put uh, what I'm looking for, pano. So it's going to show me all my albums with the pano in the name in there. And the one that I'm looking for is oh, this Kum one. So at the Kum Mela, where in India, where I just was, I shot a pano from a bridge over the entire thing, oh, entire thing, what I could see from there. Here's 12 photos. You can see the panoramic in there. So I'm just going to select all of those, right click on that and choose photo merge, panorama merge. So there's three different modes in here, spherical, cylindrical, and perspective. And you're thinking, great, how am I supposed to know which one to use? Nice and easy. Hold the mouse over it, give it a moment, and it pops up a little tooltip that tells you exactly what to do. So this one is the best quote unquote all around projection, especially for panoramas with greater than 180 degree field of view. So this one probably was over 180. Cylindrical preserves vertical straight lines best for single row panoramas with less than 180 degree field of view. Excellent. And then the perspective one says preserves vertical and horizontal straight lines best for scenes with buildings and other architectural elements. Now here's an interesting thing. I'll see if it does it on here. I'm going to click on the perspective one. Yeah, we got it. And it says unable to merge. So unable to merge selected images, please cancel and review selection. Top tip number one right now, do not click on cancel. If you click cancel, it'll actually back out of here and you have to start all over again. If, however, you ignore that, don't click cancel, you can simply click on one of the other projections and it will load that up. So you see there we get the overlapping lines while it builds the preview and boom, there we go. So pretty simple, not a whole lot of control in here, spherical, cylindrical, or perspective. I'm going to choose, I think spherical actually works better for this one, although it's very, very marginally different difference. And the other thing we have on here is the boundary warp. So boundary warp will distort the edges to fill in these gaps. If I take boundary warp and I'll just kind of slowly increase this up, you'll see the edges start to stretch out to fill in the gaps in there. 
And depending on your scene, of course, that may or may not be acceptable. You may or may not get some level of distortion that you can live with or you can't live with or it looks weird or whatever it is. The cool thing is that you can expand it out and get a bigger file by just dragging that out and get to the point where you're comfortable with what it has done. So if we go back and look at this again, if I take it down, watch, obviously we're seeing the edges fill in, but watch this side of the encampment here, watch the coastline on here. It is going to distort very, very slightly. And frankly, for my taste, I'm looking at this going, I'm perfectly happy with that. And that gives me a slightly bigger file. If you didn't want to do that, drag this back down. You obviously don't want to have the white areas in there. So you click on auto crop and it crops it down to maximize the pixels that you do have without the boundary warp. Now the neat thing here is with auto crop on, as I drag the boundary warp up, you'll see it maintain the auto crop and we literally see the file getting taller as it stretches and distorts that out. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it all the way up. Um, auto crop is not needed at this point because we've filled all the space and just click on merge and let it do its thing. And there we go. There is the final result. If we open this guy up and look at him, this is a nice big picture. And you see the stack there. It stacked those just like the HDR did. It stacked the, the pictures together, which is a nice little feature. Just kind of keeps things neat and tidy. And there is the final image. So let's hide that, give us a little bit more space in here. And once again, this is a raw file. If we look at the file name here, you'll see that it has labeled it as a pano in a .dng file. And um, yeah, raw, and there we go. So we have all the raw adjustments. So we can go in here and do whatever exposure adjustments we need to do to this and pull out whatever you want out of the file. Just a brief interruption to remind you to check out photojoseph.com where you'll find all of my YouTube videos organized by product, making it really easy to find exactly what you're looking for. You may also wanna check out my live training where I do deep dives on various photo and video apps, often resulting in hours and hours of training for those products. Also, be sure to check out the workshops page to see if there's any upcoming events you may wanna join me on. And finally, while you're there, subscribe to the newsletter so you don't miss a thing. All right, now back to our show. Now let's do the really cool one where we do the HDR panoramic combination. So let's go back to an old collection. These are seven stop brackets and there are nine of those series. And as I open these and you look at them, notice as we go through the bracketing, people are of course moving because it's, well, it's an HDR shot, so a series of shots and we have movement. So there you see bus movement and that one, oh, we're going to see car movement here. So there's a lot of movement to deal with. So this is really a particularly challenging setup because we have movement of the camera, handheld, and movement of subjects in there. So let's just select all of those, all 63 files, and go to Photo Merge and choose HDR Panorama Merge. Let's look at some problem areas. Let's look at people. So actually, the people are looking pretty good. The bus is kind of double wide in the back, so we definitely have an issue there. There's lines in the road here that have some issues. And this is something I remember seeing when I did this merge before with other software. So I know that's not a not an unusual thing. Let me try. Let's go to the cylindrical one and see if that's any better. So we're still seeing the lines in there. Not really seeing much of a difference. If I go to the, back to the spherical. So really not a whole lot of difference as far as the problem areas go. Now let's try the perspective one and see what that says. And I think it's going to tell me it can't do it. So here it says unable to merge. So once again, don't hit cancel. Just go back to one of the other versions in here. So in this case, this particular photo, we are seeing, remember, a combination of both HDR and panorama. We definitely have some issues. Fortunately, these would be pretty easy to retouch and fix in post. Um, if I want to do the boundary warp, let's see what happens there. So I hear this really isn't working, right? The boundary warp is distorting the buildings in an unpleasant way. Let's try the spherical projection. Nope, still distorting it in an unpleasant way. So I would say with this one, could we get away with any boundary warp? Probably not. Probably not going to bother with that one. I think I would let that be at its default. Turn on the auto crop and away we would go. And again, you have your auto settings in there so you can do your auto HDR on that or uh, disable that and do it all entirely automatically, uh, entirely manually. So that's where we're at now. We've got those three merging modes, the HDR, the pano and the HDR pano, super awesome. Now let's see what other features we've got to take a look at in here. So the next one we're gonna take a look at is enhanced details. There is a page on the Adobe website, and I'm gonna to link to this in the description below, that explains in extreme detail what this enhanced details is doing, algorithmically what it's doing, it's using artificial intelligence. It's kind of one of those you go, whoa, this is a really, really big deal. And in a very brief description of it, it is working with the demosaicing 
process of the raw files. So this only works with raw files. It is working with the demosaicing process using AI learning to get rid of any kind of chromatic aberration, any kind of uh, fringing, any kind of stair stepping, zippering, all the little weird artifacts that we sometimes get when you get into really, really fine details. So, I went through a bunch of my pictures this morning trying to find a photo where I could see a noticeable difference, and I couldn't find a good example of it. So, this is definitely something where it is not necessarily going to be beneficial to every single photo that you throw at it. However, Adobe fortunately provides on this web page that I've, I will, again, I will link to down below, provides a sample file. So I've downloaded their sample file, and on this one, you really can tell the difference. Now, incidentally, this sample file is a Fuji file, which is off the X-Trans sensor, so it's not a debearing pattern. It's I forget the name now, but it's another type of process, but it supports both, which is great because a lot of software does not support Fuji raw files. The Adobe process does. So here you can see what the file is. This is a Fuji Extrans example. This is the one that I downloaded from the Adobe website. It's a .raf file. It is a uh, whatever that resolution is, raw, obviously, and away we go. So let's select that picture. Open it up just so you can see what it is. It's a you know, nice shot of these buildings, uh, pretty good detail in here, but let's see what happens. So the way that you get to it is go to the photo menu and choose enhance details. This is going to take a while to generate the preview. See up here it says generating preview. This is going to take a moment to process before we can start working with it. It says in the article, and it says somewhere in the help system in here as well, that this is very GPU dependent. So you really want a fast GPU to make the most out of this. Um, it is going to take a while on this older MacBook Pro here, but it is still going to work. It just takes longer. Also, I will point out that if you look at the article that is linked below, if you look in the comments on there, I saw a lot of people saying that they have found a bug where when they run this on their files, they're getting just a black file as a result. I haven't seen that show up yet so far, but uh, but it is been, has been reported by multiple people in there. So if you are running this and you're just getting a solid black file, know that you're not alone. Apparently there's a bug. Clearly Adobe will be addressing that. All right, so here we go. Enhanced details. You see on here it says enhanced details uses machine learning to improve details, blah, blah, blah. When you're looking at the image here, it's zoomed in quite a ways. You can see we're zoomed way past one to one on here. And you can pan, just drag and pan this around. If I click and hold on it, it's going to show a before and after. Now, this particular spot of the scene isn't particularly useful. So the best thing to do is to click on the minus magnifying glass. It zooms all the way out and then click on a part of the scene that you want to see. So I'm going to go into the, uh, the bridge detail on here. Let me actually pan this up a little bit to say this uh, little lion's head detail on there. And now as I click and hold, See, there's without enhance and there's with. And that is a very dramatic difference. As Adobe explains in the blog, on some photos, you are effectively adding resolution. You're adding more, it's not more pixels, but you're adding so much more detail that you could print a larger print. And it talks about when you would actually use this. Times like doing a really large print, that's a time to get around and playing with it. If you're just posting things on Instagram, don't worry about it. There's absolutely zero advantage to this. But if you're using the full resolution, you're going to print big, this is something worth looking at, absolutely. And again, it has to be done to the raw file. So we can see a pretty significant advantage there. Uh, let's take a look at another part of it. Without and with the enhancement, it is a pretty significant advantage there. We're even seeing better, better color rendering in here as well. That's interesting. But look at the stoplights. There's big blobby pixels down to an actual proper red stoplight on there. So very, very interesting. Now it says in here estimated time four seconds. Um, I don't know what that's talking about. I think it means one, no, it's, I, maybe it's to redraw this. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's talking about estimated time just for this preview. When you click enhance, it is going to take a lot longer than four seconds to process. So that four seconds is for that little preview window. Just FYI, it'll take several minutes at least to process that file out. So there's the second big new feature. Now the next one we're going to look at is clipping indicators. Nice and simple one on here. Clipping indicators are great. I'm very, very glad to see those. Let's just uh, we'll look at this file and go into the adjustments. You'll see new little icons showing up here in the histogram. That is your clipping indicator on and off. If I turn these on, you'll get a little thing. Show shadow clipping pops up, show highlight clipping. And now if I overexpose the image to the point where I've clipped past 100%, you'll see we see that clipping data on there. Same thing with the shadows. We see that down there. There is a keyboard shortcut to turn both of those on and off. Just hit the J key and it turns both uh, highlight and shadow on and off. Also, if you have it off 
and you're dragging this around. If you hold down the Option key, you do get this overlay. So it's a clipping overlay that shows you only the clipping data. So this would be used in a case where, let's say I wanted to brighten this as much as I could without clipping. I could turn on clipping, drag this up, wait until something turns blue or red in this case, and then back down on it. Or, without turning on the clipping, start dragging it up, and while it's dragging up, hold down the Option button. And the nice thing is here is that you can just press and lift on the Option key as you go to really just kind of check it however you want. All right, the next one, last one, target adjustments. This is so cool. There's two different types of target adjustments. There's the tone curve target adjustment, and this is this, this new tiny little icon there, that little kind of targety icon. And the other one is under color, the color mixer target adjustment. Either one of these that you hit, it actually opens up the same new interface. There's a new control bar here, and from here you can swap between the two, so it doesn't really matter which one you, you hit to begin with. Here's how this works. Let's start with tone. Let's say that I'm looking at this picture and I want to darken this background range on here. Without this tool, using curves, I'm kind of guessing. Like, well, do I, do I darken here? Do I darken here? Where's the right area to grab on to darken? Let me just reset that now that I've made those changes on there. Instead of guessing where to click and drag on here, you open up the target tool, click on the part of the image that you want to adjust, and drag that brighter or darker. And it's adjusting the correct part of the curves. So cool. So let's go here. Maybe I want to make this part brighter. Click on that, make that a little bit brighter. And I've just done a perfect tone curve to brighten and darken the exact parts that I want. You can do this individually for the color channel. So I want to take the green channel on the background here and pull that down. I could do that. So you can really get in there with very, very precise adjustments. Um, or you can do that with colors as well. So let's go to hue. Let's actually do a reset, shift R to reset this. I'll go to the hue, or rather not the hue, but the color ones. And from color, I can adjust hue, saturation, or luminance. So let's say I want to saturate the red paint on our, uh, our idol here. So I'm going to click on saturation, just click and drag on that, and I can increase or decrease the saturation for that range in there. Um, pretty darn cool. Love that, love that. And then luminance as well, right? So a color luminance, I say, you know what? I want those reds to be darker. Simply click on that and make those reds darker. Very, very powerful. Rotate the hue. You can do a full hue rotation if you wanted to do that. Complete control over this. Again, this is something that we had on mobile. We've had for a long time in mobile. I've been wondering where the heck it was, and I'm super happy to see it here. So that is everything in there. That is the, the main enhancements to Lightroom CC 2.2 February 2019 release. So that is that, my friends. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell and all that good stuff. See you next time. Bye-bye.